All right. So Johnny King, I, it's been a long time since I've been able to talk to you, my friend. I see your stuff on Facebook, which is very nice. Um, how does it feel 18 years after the fact? I did a little research, and you probably know I do this with all my statistics, but to have killed the largest buck out of approximately 378 million deer that have been killed in the United States over the past 60 years. pretty humbled i mean honestly i mean it just what are the chances they say it's like winning the lottery i mean your chances of shooting that caliber of a deer is like next to nothing absolutely next to nothing his name is johnny king i am dan schmidt thanks for joining us for deer talk now johnny and i uh, i met johnny by way of what you probably already guessed the deer he shot in 2006 um but i didn't meet him until approximately i think it was in 2011 when this all happened in deer and deer hunting, we, we had Kerry Butt, we had Duncan Doby, we had some of the best reporters on the earth cover this story. And I remember going to your cabin and actually getting a chance to put my hands on that deer. And it yeah, was, I think that was 2011. Yeah, two, two, we th- all kind of got together. Yeah. 2011. So we're not going to get too much into the whole controversy today. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it because 18 years, I know some of you Deer Talk Now listeners or either very, very young or might not have even been born by then. But, um, Johnny, let's go back to before the hunt, um, 2006. Um, I know the story, but tell the, the listeners, what were you as a deer hunter back then? Were you just a gun hunter, a bow hunter? What, what, was, what was Johnny King as a deer hunter in Wisconsin? At that time, I was m- mostly just um, just rifle when I was younger, back in high school, I bow hunted a little bit with some buddies, but getting married and just busy with life, it was mostly just looking forward to the gun season and just getting together with family and friends. I, I remember that. And you've been married to your wife, Carrie, now for how many years? 25. 25 years. Congra- congratulations. That's awesome. I, I, got, I see your guys' picture and I'm like, that is a happy couple right there. You guys have a great family. Well, thank you. Yeah. So um, you're a gun hunter. Uh, Let's get to, uh, in Wisconsin, if you guys don't know it, it's always the Saturday before Thanksgiving um, is when gun season starts. What happened? Was that on open? I can't remember. Was it opening day or the second day? Or Take us through the hunt. It was opening day. So usually we all get to my uncle's early in the morning, and then we kind of go out. We don't necessarily have, like, tree stands. We just kind of got areas that we all kind of sit um and we don't have trail cameras so it's pretty much what you see that day is kind of a surprise in the morning hunt we go out and we usually sit till about 8 30 or 9 o'clock and then we gather at the buildings have a sandwich kind of tell the stories of what everybody got that morning or what they saw and then we start uh, getting to talking about the next drives that we're going to do because then we drive woods until probably i would say about two o'clock and then we sit for the last two hours of the hunt and you've done that since then too haven't you yes yep that's the way you hunt and the thing that i've always found refreshing is um i think you had the same hat the same jacket the same boots for over 20 years oh yeah i still got it still got it (laughs) yeah it's kind of uh me and my brother i mean we have this you know I, i carry the same rosary i mean everything the same you know and of course maybe not the underwear but uh you know the same shirt and undershirt and you just try to keep it the same every year you know what i mean that is i bless your heart because you are a a real deer hunter you always have been but that's what i've always found so fascinating about your story is that people say well surely he had a trail camera phone I'm like no he didn't it basically so so what happened you guys was it your uncle or a cousin what you guys were hunting together and you you saw this buck we never, we know, we didn't see it till the actual drive. Right. Yeah. You guys were doing a drive and you went in to do the drive. And Correct. You, so, you jumped it? No, I'm, I'm one of the youngest ones out of the group. So I'm always like the driver, which doesn't bother me because I kind of know where they all hide. And, and it, you know, gives me a little of excitement to kind of kick the deer out. And, you know, I've shot, I don't even know how many deer on drives. Um, but it's also pretty exciting to kick them out to let other people you know, see him. And for some reason that day, my brother told me, he goes, Johnny, why don't you take my stand today? Because usually 
we do the same drives all the time. So everybody's kind of got their own stand and the, the drive is done pretty much the same way every time. So I'm like, well, sure, you know, because this set of woods that we're going to do isn't the best drive to do. It takes like an over an hour. And I'm like, sure, I'll sit for a while. So basically my brother usually stands by a telephone pole when we do this drive. So I was walking down just an open field basically to get to this telephone pole. And I sat down, put my back up against the telephone po uh, pole and I'm just sitting there and I'm just, you know, getting situated, getting my gun down and making sure I got everything. And I looked to my right. Well, here he was, he came from the woods behind us into the woods we were driving. So I saw him before the, the deer drive even started. You saw the buck before. The, how far away was he? Oh, I would say probably about 50, 60 yards, but oh I only gosh. saw it for like a second or two. And then it was kind of behind like a little draw or ravine. And then I kept looking and looking. And then all of a sudden he came up into the woods that I was watching and I could see him standing there. And then all of a sudden there was two does standing with him. So I'm like, well, he must have been chasing them because there was no reason he had to have watched me walk right past him. I didn't see him, but he came out of the woods that I just walked right by. Wow. And, and so then what happened? So then I'm like already sitting down. So I put my rifle on my knee and I'm like, well, this has got to be, I got to take a good shot here. And sure enough, I shot and I could see that he reared back. So I knew that I hit him pretty good at that with the first shot. Okay. And what kind of rifle did you have? I had an old 3030 Savage. <laughs> it's got a, like a little three shot wow. clip. Wow. That was handed down from my father, my dad to my brother. And then my brother gave it to me when I started hunting at 12. I think you actually showed that to us, didn't you? I did. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This is, but my memory is, is starting to come back to me when we were there. This is like 13 years ago, but okay. So you take the first shot. He mule kicks. I'm, ass I'm assuming he takes off. Yeah. He's kind of standing up there, kind of going back and forth. So I'm kind of confused at this point. So I take a couple more shots and you know, at this point I'm, I'm pretty excited and I didn't see him for a little bit. And there was like a little set aside field from there to the woods that the drivers were coming back and he was probably 140 yards from me when I shot. So at that point I start crawling through this grass and then every once in a while I'd kind of peek my head up and if I could see him on that hillside, I would take a shot at him. Well, it felt like forever, but it was probably only two or three minutes, but I finally got to the fence line and I'm like, well, I either got to jump this fence and he's going to take off or I got to get a good shot. So I jumped up and he was just at the top of the hill and I shot and then I didn't see him anymore. So I wasn't sure if I got him at that point or not. So I, I ran to the top of that hill where he was. And then I just stood there and I couldn't see him no more. And at this point, you know, the, the, I could see the drivers. They were just getting dropped off. So I got another hour before they get through these woods. So I just kind of stood up on top and got myself so I could watch both draws. So when they, that he didn't get away. And then I just waited for the drive to the drivers to come back through. Okay. And uh, at, at this point, I was like, so you, you you see this buck. I mean, first of all, when you saw him, were you just like, oh, my gosh, that's the biggest buck I've ever seen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was the biggest one I've ever seen, for sure. And it took those guys quite a while, so you're just waiting for them to get out of the drive before you can go look for them, right? Right. Or, or I knew he was in the woods that they were driving. So if he wasn't already dead, I knew that they were going to kick him back to me. Okay. Yeah. So then what happened? And sure enough, they, they turned the corner and started coming back my way. And I could see the drivers at this point, and, and he did come running back out. Oh, that and that that, that point, part I forgot. Okay, keep going. Yeah. And at that point, I shot again, and he did fall down. And so then I run down to where I, I saw him last. And like I said, this is just some tall grass, so I wasn't exactly sure where he was. But by the time I got to that point, he was he was up again. So he ran down to this fence line and he was injured enough to where he couldn't actually jump the fence. So he's kind of like trotting along the fence line. And I should back up a little bit as he was running towards that fence line. I did take one more shot and he fell down again. And at that point, we could, you'll, I don't know if you're going to get into that later, but that brought up yep. some controversy because I, sh I shot the main beam at that point, not realizing it. Yep. You put a hole right through, right through it, right through it. Yep. But the antler was still on at this point. Mm -hmm. 
So now I'm standing down by the fence line and my cousin Brad's on the bottom side of the, of the drive. So I start yelling at my cousin Brad, cause at this point I'm out of bullets. Well, <laughs> back up a little bit more. So the hunting suit that I'm wearing was passed down from my brother. So my brother was quite a bit taller. Well, when he passed it down to me, he was 16 or 17 and I was 12 and then he had it. And then I wore it for 20 some years. So when I started wearing it when I was 12, I mean, I had to roll it up. I mean, it was, it was pretty big, mm-hmm. but finally, at the, um, but over the years with just dr- doing deer drives and everything, so the side pocket had holes in it. Well, I did have some extra bullets, but they fell out between all of the excitement <laughs> and the crawling and things like that. So I'm out of bullets. So I yell at my cousin, Brad, he comes down, he shoots it. So then we're like, you know, doing some high fives and, you know, I'm, oh my God, this thing is amazing. And we're just kind of walking around and catching my breath. And then <clears throat> my cousin Brad like straddles the deer. So he's like sitting on its back, you know, at this point and ho- holding up the wreck and miring it. And then I'm just kind of walking around. Can't believe it at this point. And I walk around and all of a sudden we thought the deer was dead. It looked at me and it went to get up. Well, it kicked my cousin Brad off. So my, my cousin Brad's kind of like on the ground and here he's holding one side of the rack because he had such a, he had such a hold on the rack that when he went, to, it scared him. He, it, he pulled the rack off to where I shot through it. It was just a perfect hairline crack yep. that actually went right through that it fit right perfectly back on. But so at this point we're like, Oh my God, just you know what happened? What? And then it, it took us a while to put the two and two together to put it back on. And Oh my God, you know, I sh- actually shot through the main beam. So, right. I, I do remember yeah. that. I forgot that he was actually like straddling it when, yeah, he was sitting on its back. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I walked around and then it saw me, it jumped and went to get back up again. Did it, w- did it die pretty quickly then after that or? Unfortunately, we had to have one more. So one, one more. It was okay. the toughest deer I've ever seen. Yeah. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Ten Point Crossbow Technologies. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you, or log on to TenPointCrossbows.com for more information. Well, and just so you guys wonder, okay, num- number one, this is almost 20, 20 years ago. Uh, number two, yeah. this is the biggest, th- there is controversy, and we're going to talk about that, but it was the biggest typical ever in the history of North America. It grossed um, by Boone and Crockett's score, we're going to get into that a little bit, John Ramsey grossed it at 225 and 7 eighths as a clean 12, uh, 12 pointer, 6 by 6, and netted 218 and 4 eighths, making it like, uh, I mean, Hanson Buck was like 213 and some change, like five inches b- bigger than the world record. Um, when you, okay, so you fi- you finally get this deer, you're so excited. And I know that you weren't into the whole, you know, scoring and all that kind of stuff. At what point did you or your buddies, your family realize that this might be something super special? Um, it, it took a couple months. I mean, you know, we thought it was really big, but like I said, we've never had a deer scored. Nobody in the whole family has ever had a deer scored. And so we had no idea, you know, we were trying to like, well, I know you do the inside spread and you kind of do this, but we had no idea to even, even try to put a tape to it. And since I shot through the main beam, I thought, well, there's no way that I could even have it scored. But my brother was pretty persistent. He's like, no, you got to have somebody take a look at that deer, you know. And finally, I agreed, and I called up, and that's when I got a hold of John Ramsey, and I took the deer to John Ramsey. Okay, so that's that's a great segue. I have to put my glasses on for this. You can't see me, Johnny, because you're on, just on phone. But, okay, so John Ramsey was an – I don't know if he still is, but he was an official Boone and Crockett measurer from Wisconsin – uh, I think he worked with the Wisconsin Buck and Bear Club as well. Um, when he got his hands on it, I think I told you guys that already, but he looked at it and immediately knew that uh, Johnny had a potential world record here. Uh, the question that John had as well was that that broken beam had to be resolved by Boone and Crockett. Well, comes to what they come to find out was that was never an issue. If it's a broken beam and they can prove... 
uh, that it goes together, which they did, there is no question. Um, but John had officially scored it, like I said, at 218 and four eighths um, with a gross of 225 and uh, seven eighths. Um, but he said he had to talk to a guy at Boone and Crockett by the name of Jack Renault um, that if the broken p- point would come into play. Well, at that point, what is what does Jack Renault tell John, Johnny? Well, basically, when I left there, I mean, I had no idea. Like I said, I never had a deer scored. And then John's like, he kind of put some numbers together and kind of showing me how the whole scoring system worked. And then at the very end, he just kind of looked at me. He goes, do you know what you have here? And I'm like, no, I no idea. And he goes, you possibly have a new world record. And at that point, you know, he just says, you know, you, you need to get in contact with some people. Or he actually, I think that's how, uh, um, what was his name? Steve Ashley. Oh, I yes. Think he contacted, I think he contacted Steve Ashley, and then Steve Ashley got in touch with me and came to take a look at it. And then we just, then he told me to contact, you know, Boone and Crockett, give them the situation. So I contacted Boone and Crockett. They wanted some pictures. And that went on for a little bit. But they couldn't meet with me or they didn't want to send anybody from Montana they did tell me that they were doing a Pope and Young show in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. And that would probably, for me, that would be closer from Wisconsin to head there to have somebody take a look at it because all the scores were going to be there. So at that point, I decided that I was going to take the deer to Hamburg to have everybody from Boone and Crockett take a look at the deer. To Pennsylvania, which which I have to remind people is not a short distance from Wisconsin. How far a drive well, was that? That was like, what, 20 hours 17. or something? 17 18 hours yeah so my you... dad and my buddy we hopped in a vehicle and took off to pennsylvania yep. so you're driving to pennsylvania with your dad and your buddies 17 18 hours you get there i remember this but i'm gonna let you tell the story so you get to pennsylvania you're just like okay they got to look at this thing there's no money or anything involved in this you're just saying it's got be kind of cool if there's a world record so what happens? Yeah. You get to Pennsylvania, what happens? So we kind of go in the back entrance. It's all kind of hush-hush. I actually built a wood box for it. We carried it in. Um, so at that point, Steve, I don't remember who we talked to, but basically, you know, we went up an elevator. We're leaving the deer here. So then basically at this point, they told me that I couldn't be in the room when they looked at it. So we just basically went back downstairs, and I walked through Cabela's until we got the call to come back up and – hear what they had to say yeah and what what did they tell you well that's when i met jack um nobody else was in the room it was just jack my dad and my buddy woody and he basically said you know he had a great deer here the the um where you shot it through that's not an issue it fits cleanly back on but he brought up the point that the g3 comes off the g2 so at that point he's basically saying it's not a world record right and um, what we know, which what a lot of people don't know, which is, it kind of bothers me is, and I guess it's just because they're either too young or they're not informed enough. By the letter of the regulations, that was not a shared point. That that point was, its, was of its own uh, origin. And the only, there was basically one person who decided he didn't like the way it looked, so he tried to characterize it as, no, that's a shared point. Am I getting that correct? Pretty much. And and, and me being naive and not ever having a deer scored, I mean, this is, you know, Boone and Crockett, this is one of their senior guys telling me that. You know, I didn't know if it was right or wrong until eventually I got to meet a lot of great people through this whole deer, and, you know, they were saying that, no, that's that's not in their books. That's That's not the way it should be. Yeah. So let me uh, let me pause there and just give a little background. So Johnny's like, OK, I guess I guess it's not. So we're going to drive back to Wisconsin. Well, then when he gets back to Wisconsin and now this you have to understand this ruminated for almost five years it was over four where Johnny was like going around. People are saying, well, wait a second. No, that's not what the rule says. Great guys like Craig Cousins, Ron Bushy, guys that had 30 years as Boone and Crockett scores, who put thousands of deers, deer into the books, Jeff Brown from the Northeast Big Buck Club, who, by the way, 
That club declared it as their world record. Buckmasters declared it as their world record. They said, no, the, by the way this is written, um, that is a that is a legit six by six clean typical that nets and it's we got into a little bit of arguing as far we didn't the, the scores as far as uh, uh, we're talking change here but it still beat milo hansen so over those let's just say johnny over those next four years you were kind of carrying this torch on by yourself like hey i think this would be cool to get this recognized what were those before this blew up into something bigger what were those years like for you i know you're you were in construction you did uh uh, project management you did all sorts of jobs you actually work for a living and you're kind of doing this stuff on the side what how did that change your life well it affected it uh, quite a bit i mean i got to like i said i got to meet some great people in 2007 when i came back from pennsylvania it was about the time for the wisconsin deer and turkey expo so we put it on display there and that's where i got to meet jay fish and then we became friends and then through jay fish met you know, Marlon Laidlaw and Agrada, Ron Bushy in 2010, got to meet a lot of great people. And then you, you know, the year after. Um, but I got to the point, and I understand Jay's issue. I never wanted to be the guy that would sell out a deer for money. And that wasn't the reason. But I just knew that I wanted more people to see the deer. So that's when I agreed to sell it to Jay Fish because it didn't do me a lot of good because I didn't have the money or the resources to be going all over the United States to be going to shows. And I knew Jay would represent the deer very well and let people hold it and see it. Um, so I wanted, not for me just to look at it in my living room, I wanted everybody to see it. So I agreed to sell it to Jay Fish at that point. And then Jay was great because he was like, you know, anytime you can make a show, you know, if we're going to be there, um, you know, you're more than welcome to come along. It was more, he was just trying to help me fight with it, but he was the owner, but I was still the guy that shot it. And I got to be a big part of that through over the years. Yeah. And I got to meet Jay and, 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 uh, learn, become friends with him. What i what I learned, if you guys don't know who Jay Fish is, he was an antler collect is an antler collector. He's from Wisconsin. I believe he lives in Michigan now, but, um, his whole thing was this deer needs to, it wasn't, the, it wasn't about Johnny. It was about the deer. It was like, this deer needs to be recognized. This is a legit, this is a historical deer for North America. And Ron Bushy, the most honest man I think I have ever met. And his whole thing, he he embodied Boone and Crockett. His thing was like about honesty and the truth. And he wanted people to know the truth and about this whole story. Well, we're going to get into that in another podcast as far as all the stuff that unraveled. But just so you guys know, Johnny wasn't like seeking to make money off of this. Neither really was Jay. I mean, Jay, yeah, he showed it around, but he didn't make hardly anything off of it. Johnny, I, I do believe you got a like a reproduction of the rack. Did you not? Yeah. Just, yeah. Jay got me a replica. Yeah. So you yeah. still have like, you know, I think you had it mounted and it was in your your cabin, you got to look at it as like, that's what the deer looks like on a replica. You can't really tell, but the antlers, like Johnny said, he wanted, I remember going to like the Wisconsin deer and Turkey expo and seeing little kids go. I had pictures of like little kids holding this rack, like, Oh my gosh, you know, it would be kind of like going to a baseball memorabilia and I hate to use, <laughs> compare it as a sport, yeah. but you know, like holding a Babe Ruth ball or something is like this, this is the biggest typical ever. You know, it well, was that was the nice thing. We never had it mounted. So when you went to a show and yeah. a six year old kid came up, he got to hold it, get its picture taken. That that was awesome. Yeah, that was that was the best thing. And I I gotta bring up a quote here. I did mention Jeff Brown uh from the Northeast Big Buck Club. Uh, of official Boone and Crockett score for decades. No doubt about it, Brown said we spent three hours with this deer. We analyzed every rule book we have and determined that it meets every single requirement of that of a typical. Our goal is not to dispute Boone and Crockett. Our goal is to be consistent with the rules of a scoring club. 
which there is no overemphasis on symmetry. Symmetry is purely related to net scores. So basically what the issue was, was that G3, and we're going to show you lots of pictures in the po podcast if you're watching the video version, that G3 was shorter than the other G3. And um, I know there was some comments made by a couple of people who didn't like the deer that they say, do you really want that little point, that buck with that little point to be in your, your new world record? Am I remembering that correctly, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but consider the mass and the size of the whole deer. That point from side to side on the G3 is roughly three inches. So for that many, so the whole rest of the deer is only four inches. That's unheard of. Right. I mean, yeah, it's just as close to perfect as you're going to get. Absol that many inches. Absolutely perfect. So yeah. um, I one thing I do not remember did, did, had you ever, after you shot it, did you hear, ever hear from any neighbors or anybody who said, yeah, they saw that deer, they knew about it or anything like that? My, my uncle sold off a part of his farm. I don't know how many years back before I shot that deer, but a guy was actually saw it bow hunting and he wanted to get it with the bow. Wow. And he actually had, we had an early season for CWD because that was a lot of CWD in that area. He actually had the opportunity to shoot it in October, the year I shot it in November, with a rifle, but he wanted to get it with a bow. But it was pretty, pretty hush up. We didn't hear about that until after I shot the deer. But on the neighboring farm, a guy did find the sheds from the year before, a five by five, and it scored over 200 inches as as a four and a half year old deer. Wow, it was I, that, it's, those are parts I don't remember. So it was a it was a ten pointer the year before that grossed over 200 yep and uh, now if you guys don't know back then and i still think they have it where uh, in these cwd zones basically it's like have at it you can kill deer whenever right yeah i think they're starting to let up on it a little bit but pretty much yeah back I mean, then they it... were giving tags out yeah back back when i shot the deer i think you could get like four or five tags i mean don't quote me but yeah, yeah it was unbelievable and how many does you can shoot or whatever and you could shoot bucks too i mean i th i know that they had it like basically you could i think if you shot x amount of does you could shoot a buck well this guy could have killed it in october which would have been unconventional because it wasn't a regular gun season and he decided to pass it up that i didn't know correct wow yep he, he, he passed it up yep that's absolutely crazy and so 20 years have passed you guys you're, you're still hunting that uh, land with your family is deer hunting still as enjoyable for you now as it was then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's still the excitement of just, I haven't really actually, because I got some property now that I hunt on my own. I haven't been down to my uncle's for a couple of years, but <laughs> it's the same. I got my brother and my nephew that come to my place now, and it's just about getting together and telling stories when, when it's all done. That is awesome. And in case you guys are wondering, it's western Wisconsin where uh, Johnny shot this deer. Actually, it was in the heart of what is uh, CWD uh, Center, I guess, for Wisconsin, Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. That's where uh, it was first discovered. What What is the deer hunting like, Johnny? Is Are there still lots of deer, or has it gone down, or have you seen anything in that regard? Nothing like when I first started hunting, and I just don't know if it's the deer population or just people hunt different now. You know, because a lot of people don't push deer. Now mm -hmm. people just kind of go and they'll sit all day. So I don't know if that's why we don't see as many as I did when, like, when I was, you know, in my early 20s versus now. Right. Yeah, That I found that, too. It's like I grew up hunting just like you, but we, we grew up hunting up north, and we did the same thing. We'd start drives, you know, halfway through opening day. Um, but you, yeah. you just don't see that anymore. Right. I mean, we would we would have... When we were growing up, I mean, somebody would be driving this way and this side of the fence, and we'd be going the other way, and, you know, there would be you'd be nothing to see 15, 20 people, you know, just walking around different woods, but not anymore. No, but everybody's having fun, too, which oh, yeah. there's something to be said about that. Well, Johnny, thank you so much. There's so much more we could go into. Um, I'm going to save that for another day. Um, I want to just thank you for joining us, and also um, I'm so glad that you're still at it. Because uh, after killing all a buck like that, it'd be easy to see somebody say, yeah, I've done it all already. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's not always about the deer. It's about just getting out there and having a good time. So Awesome. Well, thanks, Johnny. I hope you have a great day and say hi to everybody over at your family for me. 
Yeah, you too. Thanks, and say hi to your family. Take care. Okay, that's Johnny King, the hunter of, and the, uh, would I say harvester, of the biggest typical ever in a, in North America. I know that's um, going to be controversial with some people, but um, still, no matter how you slice it, a 12-point buck that grossed over 218 and netted uh, 215, uh, yeah, 215. Um, unbelievable deer. Uh, for Johnny King, make sure that you go to um, our website for links or on these podcasts. We're going to put in the, the link section a link to the upcoming podcast because we're going to get into more of the details of what we call what was a world cover uh, cover up, world record cover up on this deer and get into some of the politics that happened behind this deer and why it is not universally considered the biggest whitetail of all time. For Johnny King, I am Dan Schmidt. Thanks for joining us. Every Thursday, you can catch a new episode of Deer Talk Now. And all we ask you to do is like and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching this podcast. We'll catch you next week for another episode.